first of all, I just wanted to say good to see you again, Ramses. And hello, good to meet you, Q. My pleasure, Ms. Debra. So let's get right to it. Civic Cipher is a space for learning about politics and civic engagement and so much more. So tell our audience about the mission of your show and the lessons, if you have any to share, that you've been able to uh, share with your audience. With Civic Cipher, we never planned to start the show. We walked away from our careers because we needed to reaffirm that Black Lives Matter. And they told us they didn't want to do a show that did that. So we quit. What he said, what literally what he said was, Ramses, I don't want to do a black show. This is a hip hop station, mind you. He said that to me. So at that point, I quit and I quit for Q. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't even present. I quit for Q. <laughs> but he knew he had the autonomy to quit for me. Yeah. And we couldn't keep going to work at a place that would say that. So you were gifted this trademark, White Lives Matter, by one of your listeners. Tell us where this billion dollar valuation came from. It's interesting because I'm not the, you know, everyone has been very kind and everyone understands the spirit in which, you know, we're moving with respect to this mark. But, you know, journalists are journalists. And there was a journalist uh, from a very popular media outlet who kept asking that question, you know, what wh say this guy wants to come and buy it from you? What, what, what would you do? Um, we're not interested in selling it. Well, listen, if you had to come up with an imaginary number, what would make you even think about it? Well, I suppose, and then I'm thinking of the most ridiculous thing I can think of. Uh, if a person came and offered us a billion dollars to reassign the trademark, um, again, we're not interested in selling, but if a person were to offer a a billion dollars, we would be forced to consider, and that's exactly what I said verbatim, um, what that amount of money could do to help issues that are important to black and brown people in this country. And of course, the way media outlets work, the headline became well beyond the spirit of what it was we were trying to convey in that conversation. I want to better understand that because to have a trademark, you have to be using it in the category. Yes. For, okay, so how are you using that so it it would be better if we didn't answer that question to your liking but what we can say is that um it is possible to engage in commerce and fail at it i understand that explicitly thank okay. you if there's somebody who thought of some smart way to reimagine what that mark meant and we could figure out a way to help the most people right because you know not everyone's going to be happy no matter the outcome right? but i couldn't imagine a way to take the phrase on its face right it's declared racist hate speech its only original purpose was to be contrary to black lives matter but if there's a tangible way that could happen and our people could benefit from it then it's a conversation that we'd love to have so. I don't know if you've ever read Faces at the Bottom of the Well by the late Derek Bell, uh, the law professor. We will. <laughs> okay, great. So in it, he imagines a world where racism is legal and it's taxed. And so you just have to pay um, a fee for the privilege of that. And then the money is re refocused uh, to... Uh, support Black people's ability to get an education, secure housing, and all the other things. So I guess that leads me to the question, which is, um, there are those who think that you should license the trademark and use the money to do good in the community. And so how have you um, engaged with or grappled with that question? That's a good one, because it's the one we've had to go back and forth about that's, the most. That's we, our first question. Yeah, before we even accepted the assignment of the mark. Question one was, listen, there are going to be people, and you have to understand, we didn't know we'd be lucky enough to meet you, right? So say we never talk to you, the emancipator doesn't care about this story, and we don't get to talk this out. There's going to people be people that see that phrase and see that we own it, and then that's it. That's the whole story to them. Scariest thing for us was a lot of the comments when this first became public was like, man, they're geniuses, because in their mind, this was something that we did to exploit financially. Like Rams has said, if somebody would have said to us, hey, we'll give you a billion dollars for that with no intent on selling it, we have to pause there because we can send a million kids to college. The amount of things you could do with that amount of money, we think could far outweigh the hurt. But we're faced with that reality immediately because as soon as this story became big, 
We got interviewed by Complex Magazine. They then invited us to a convention that they had in California. And guess who shows up at this convention? Your favorite rapper from Chicago, right? And his shoes are all over the feet of the people in attendance. There's 100,000 people there over two days. And they got their phones out and they're very excited that he's there. Imagine 100,000 people in White Lives Matter shirts and in a convention. The, the, the negative possible outcomes are so large that if something financially happened, we still have to be the stewards of the mark. Right. So like you said, if we licensed, if we licensed it to an organization, OK, what are your intentions? Why is this worth something to you? That would be my first question. Why is this worth money to you? It's not worth money to us. So it has to be worth money to you for a reason. And if that's to exploit or hurt people, then the dollar amount kind of doesn't matter because that's not what that's not the outcome that we want. I wanted to ask you another question, and it's, it's grounded in the fact that the Emancipator is reimagining the, the nation's first abolitionist newspapers. And so we're interested in what you guys are doing from the standpoint of whether or not this is a, a movement strategy. Um, is this the kind of proactive uh, protest trademarking that is something that makes sense for, for, for activists? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um... I'm not going to pretend like we had this idea the whole time, but seeing how effective it is, it's another tool, a very useful tool. Now there's a strategy in place where, hey, listen, if something is going to harm people in mass and people are going to profit from it or whatever, you know, I mean, in communities, you can put together a couple thousand dollars and get something done um, on a small scale level. So as a strategy, absolutely, there's things that can be done. Um, it just now that the possibilities have opened up, we can see it and start to get creative with it. We're going to do some cool stuff in the future. We think we're hoping, fingers crossed. Our intention was to share this with everybody. And we think we found a way to, to be able to do that. So stand by because we think that'll be special too. We are waiting with bated breath to hear all about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a labor of love, literally. The sunshine part of this entire trademark situation has been more eyeballs more attention to Civic Cipher. And, you know, Ramses and I started a nonprofit and our objective was very, very simple. Most people we believe are good people. And when given the opportunity to give back and help people, they will. But most people are also kind of lazy with regard to that. So most people, just because they don't know how, don't. They don't volunteer. They don't donate to charities. So they just don't engage at all. Ramses and I were in the streets in the wake of George Floyd's murder marching with a bunch of people that looked like us, but with more people that didn't. Mm. And that was the disconnect that we saw. There was this impression that we don't have allyship and that there are not people who are not Black that care about our plights and the things that we're going through in our communities. So how do we come up with a way to tell people who want to help us how, right? How do we get rid of some of these barriers and some of these barricades that keep people from engaging in our issues because it's awkward or uncomfortable? We cannot be in a position where people are scared to engage, scared to help, feel like they're the enemy, feel like there's no room for forgiveness or reconciliation. Like we have to build that bridge and encourage people who have no idea what a day, what the daily life of someone that looks like us is in this country. That's all very powerful. And we can't thank you enough for your commitment and um, the the responsible way, just so much gravitas you bring to this, this issue. And every time you talk about it, um, I personally feel so edified to be in your presence. So thank you.